Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for ISACA Live. I'm Paul Phillips, Director of Event Content Development, and I'm here today with Lisa Young to talk about risk scenarios. Lisa will also be discussing this topic at ISACA, at the ISACA conference in New Orleans in a few weeks. So I encourage you to join us virtually or in person uh, in New Orleans for that uh, session. So let's get started. Lisa, welcome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So I know we have a short time together today and I'm just super excited to be here. So thank you all for, for chiming in and please do ask questions as we go along. So my mantra is risk management is a team sport. And so I'm passionate about data-driven risk-based decision-making and using sort of both uh, the strengths of risk management and the strengths of audit and compliance together to help uh, with the strategy of the organization. So thank you for uh, being here. Great. Well, thank you for having us, Lisa. We invited you because you're one of our risk experts. So um, why don't we just get started? We only have a few minutes and why don't we get started with the basics? So can you explain to uh, the attendees what is a risk scenario? Yes, absolutely. So um, one of the challenges that we have in information and technology risk management is to identify the important or relevant risks that, you know, among all the things that could possibly go wrong with, you know, information and technology, um, given our pervasive presence of digital assets, right? So, and the business's dependence on digital assets, one of the techniques that we use to overcome this challenge is the development and use of risk scenarios. It's a core approach to bringing sort of realistic, um, you know, getting the organization engaged, improved risk analysis and structure to the complexities of, of information and technology risk. Now, risk scenarios are not um, something different. You're, you're already in, in many of you are already doing this. So and they fit into the risk assessments that you're already performing. So remember that risk assessments are about identifying things that have not yet happened. Right. Some risk scenarios may never materialize. This is different than a control assessment. Right. Which is looking for conformance to a set of criteria and it's the primary domain of audit and compliance. So risk is about what could go wrong, okay? Not what has already or or um, or a control deficiency. So thank you for that um, intro, Paul. So, so Lisa, tell us why is it so important that we develop risk scenarios? And in the same vein, um, what if we don't? What, what if an organization does not have a risk scenario development process. What does that look like? Right. So if you don't have a risk scenario uh, process now, there's several different options you can look at. First of all, are you in your organization, is anybody doing business impact analysis for business continuity or disaster recovery planning? That's a great area to collaborate with your coworkers who are already doing some business impact scenarios, right? That's a form of scenario analysis. And you know, the reason why um, risk scenarios are important is because they help us communicate, right? In a story, right? So if I said to you, there's water on the floor. Okay, well, there's water on the floor. But if I said to you, there's water on the floor, a condition, and someone could slip and fall, someone could hurt themselves, someone could, some bad you know, uh, event could materialize, it helps put context to the narrative of a particular, a particular thing. Right. And um, these benefits make risk scenarios valuable also as a way of framing and scoping the things that could go wrong. And also it helps you document the assumptions. One of the things that I notice when organizations have a realized risk, like when it, when when there's no more uncertainty and an incident materializes, there's often things that um, we took for granted or we assumed that were in place but we did not um, have a way to discuss them or talk about them before it materialized. So I'm sorry, you might've asked me two questions there and I probably only answered one, but keep no, going. No, you did perfect there. So, so we talked about what is a risk scenario and why it's important. So uh, let's talk about what are the essential steps of creating an effective 
risk scenario? What are some of the uh, important components of a risk scenario? Okay, that's great. All right, so let's think about this from a top down and from a bottom up. So uh, top down, think about your organization. Think about the products and services that it delivers. Think about how you deliver those products and services, and then connect that to the underlying information and technology and even suppliers that are used to help you deliver your products and services. Think about, you know, in the context of your organizational objectives, what things, what risks, what uh, could get in the way of you delivering those products and services and where are your dependencies? So that's one way of thinking about scenario analysis from the top down. The, the other way of thinking about them is an asset approach. You know, if you have some critical assets uh, and, and most of the time today we use a bottom up approach. We start with the assets and we say what could go wrong with assets. But I think having a top down approach is also important and really mixing those two together, you know, saying, what business processes do I have? What products and services do I deliver? Who are my suppliers and vendors? What are my dependencies? And then what could go wrong? Then trace that to the 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 um, the assets that you're using to support those business processes. That's great. So so let's talk about then in, in those steps and in, in that process. Yes. Who should be uh, involved? in creating a risk scenario? Do we involve senior management or IT? Who should be involved? Well, remember that, um, you know, risk means different things at different levels of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about different levels of abstraction, uh, senior management should definitely sort of, you know, they set the direction for the organization and they basically help you set the context for what's important to the business, okay? So yes, senior leaders should be involved, but think about all your other stakeholders. Think about, you know, the people who are operationally delivering services and products for your organization. They're close to the action. They know what could potentially go wrong, right? And then, you know, think about also the people who work in information and technology and information security and audit. They also have a very good lens um, that they can actually uh, help you understand, should I be worried about something? Remember, risk is about looking forward at what could materialize, right? It hasn't happened yet. So what you want to do is have people on the front lines of the organization tell you things, what I call squishy spots. Like, where is there something squishy, like that's not quite performing in the way that I would like it to? And is there something around there that could keep us from meeting our strategy and our objectives? Okay, so, so let's talk about this. Think about this for a second. I believe you said if we do a bottom up approach, if I heard you correctly, we're looking at assets, right? So uh, at some point, I, logically, someone has to identify those assets, rate those assets, in other words, determine if they're critical or not critical. Yep. Okay, great. So I, I'm learning something here. <laughs> and then we have to uh, develop the risk scenario or what could go wrong in order to cause harm, loss, or damage to that critical identified asset. Absolutely, and I'll give you a very specific example Great. of how to think about this. If you are an organization that processes customer payments, for example, on your website, you know, and that could be a government organization who takes payments for utilities or services that they deliver. It could be a, a revenue generate business. So it could be any type of organization. And what happens is you have a, a server that accepts payments from your customers. And if that server goes down, oftentimes as technology people will say, well, the server went down because it has a vulnerability and it has some technology thing and it has something else going on and it broke. Okay. But if you, and that's important from an asset perspective, and that's important to the people who are trying to get that asset back in operation. But if you say, you know, if you report out, my server is down, I am unable to accept customer payments, and that impacts our ability to deliver or to serve customers, all of a sudden then you've connected that asset to a strategic objective, to the strategy of the organization, which is in this case, serving customers and accepting their payment, right? So it's definitely both are important. And remember that asset has importance because of its role in the delivery 
of your products and services that you that you are in business to deliver, right? And that's the major connection. And that's also how you can help determine which assets are more critical than others, right? Because remember, this is about risk. This is about something that may or may not materialize. And knowing that we have, you know, we're resource constrained often in INT. We can't always, you know, uh, protect 100% of everything in our, in our shops. So if we know which of those assets are most important to delivering the products and services that we exist to, to deliver, then that helps us understand asset criticality also. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So let's say we've, we, we've gone through that process. We've developed the risk scenarios. Then what? Right. So that's the beauty of using scenarios is they tell a story that could happen. Right. And it also allows you to collaborate with your colleagues. Remember I said at the beginning of this, you know, if you have somebody in your organization who's already doing um, business impact analysis for business continuity scenarios, oftentimes business continuity scenarios are extreme, meaning they'll be like, you know, the whole data center is down, the whole cloud provider is down. You know, it's a bigger type of, of, of event planning or, you know, impact analysis. If you dial that back a little bit and you say, well, wait a minute, if we made the assumption that the whole cloud wasn't down, right, but just portions of the cloud, how would we continue to operate in a degraded state, right? Mm -hmm. How would we, um, what, what services would we turn on or turn off? What things would we do to get back in service? But in the meantime, maybe for some period of time, we have to operate not at full capacity. And in this scenario sort of is a continuum, right? It allows you to ebb and flow. Well, what if this were available? What if this was not available? What if we only had part of this vendor service available? What if we had a different part? And it allows you to sort of, you know, through tabletop exercises or through just having a discussion with your stakeholders, it allows you to record your assumptions. Have we ever thought of this scenario before? If so, what would we do, right? So it's not either or, it's, um, you know, it's it's a nuance, right? Because we know that technology is pretty robust. I mean, it's it's a pretty robust thing, but we do have failures. So how do we work around them and how do we make sure that we continue to meet our objectives even when we don't have full information and technology capacity. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, you know, I've always thought of risk scenarios as forecasting, if you will, just like the financial industry, they have to do forecasting. Well, in the financial industry, when they do forecasting, they go back from time to time based on things that they've learned and modify their forecasting. Do we do that with risk scenarios? Without a doubt, absolutely. And that's the, also the beauty of keeping a robust set of risk scenarios, right? Because what happens is as you learn, as you learn about things, let's say you do have a realized risk and, it, and you are cleaning up from an incident, a, a risk actually occurred. Now you know there's no more uncertainty. It's an issue, it's a problem. It's something that you have to address right now. And what happens is as you learn from these uh, risks that are realized, you actually go back and update the scenarios and you check your assumptions. You basically say, was the playbook that we're using to recover from this type of event, you know, was the script I was using, was the procedure that I was using, is it actually, uh, is, it, is it right? You know, what did we do differently in reality when we were trying to clean up than was written in our script or our playbook or anything? So these scenarios should be living, they should be evolving, uh, they should be changing as you learn more about relevant risk. Um, so I'll stop there and say, was that everything you asked, asked me? Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You're doing great. So let, let's, I love to connect the dots. So we have risk registers, we have a risk yes. assessment process, we have risk quantification, we have the uh, the uh, model, uh, the th three lines of defense. I had a, a, a brain freeze there for a second the three lines of defense there so help us lisa connect all of those dots as to where does risk scenario fit in that whole process uh, of assessment quantification register and what have you okay great okay so let me uh let me start with risk register so a risk register it doesn't have to be fancy risk register uh is absolutely sort of your top level view of the risks that are under management. 
and they should be by category, like by buckets, right? Um, and they're very, uh, if you have a list of risks, right, whether they're in a spreadsheet, whether they're in a tool, doesn't really matter. If you have a list of risks, go through them and see if you could consolidate them into buckets. An organization generally needs around 10 to 12 buckets of risk scenario, no matter their size. But you may have 40 or 50 risk scenarios with different nuances in them. And so risk scenarios can be uh, helpful for risk identification. You can help people understand, you know, communicate a story. Um, someone asked me who should develop the scenarios. So the scenarios should be developed if you have a risk team, great. But it's it's the input from the stakeholders that are on the front line of your business who actually can tell you what they're concerned about, right? Um, and then test and update them. That's a that's a uh, that could be anybody from the risk team to the audit team to your stakeholders and in information and technology. People should exercise these as a way to get them updated, right? Um, so Absolutely. let's see. Somebody, wait, you asked me something else. Oh, quant quantification. So remember that risk quantification is part of the analysis step. So if you identify some areas of concern, you do some risk scenario and you say, okay, these are the things that we believe are in a risk scenario that we should be concerned about. Now, do I want to perform some additional analysis on that? because I need to know how to prioritize, how to respond, how to rank stack my risks. Quantification could be a great tool for that to choose what your next step is, to choose what the response would be to, to the risks that are in your register. Gotcha. So I, I think this is going to where we're, we're, doing, we're doing really good on time. I'm going to ask this question and then if there's any uh, questions from the group, we'll take those. But let's talk about risk reporting. So mm -hmm. do we uh, we have a document of risk scenarios that uh, we report up to the senior management and the board of directors? Is that appropriate? Right. So scenarios are a little more fine grained because they have some documented assumptions. They may even have some controls you have in place. So those are not generally the level of reporting to senior leaders or board. What you mm -hmm. want to do is group those risks into buckets and report that we are managing, for example, the risk of data loss. Here's our top couple of scenarios where we could have data loss or data leakage, right? And so uh, so you want to, to report out at a level that is meaningful to the board, meaningful to senior leaders, and make sure that they know that, you know, you are tracking this, this um, uh, top list of concerns, you know, things that they're concerned about, things that they've seen in the news, right? That That's what they want to know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm getting a few comments here in the chat. A couple of people are uh, emphasizing the importance of how we articulate risks to senior leadership. Uh, make sure we articulate them in business terms. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what the business wants to know. There's always three things that I report to the board. One is, what does my risk landscape look like? What is the bigger risk picture, depending on what business I'm in, depending on what we do for a living, what type of organization we are, what is out there that they might have seen in the news, what is out there they may have read in a magazine, and are we concerned about it, and do we have a particular scenario that addresses it? Number two is they want to know how the security program is is operating, right? Like, am I am I operating a good, robust, mature security program? And the third thing they always want to know is what is what should I be concerned about that I'm not? Like, what 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 is out there that could get in the way, right? Uh, that we're not currently developing scenarios for, right? Sometimes scenarios are very forward looking, meaning multi year scenarios, right? And so, so they're not just, you know, what's in the news today, that's important, but it's like what could happen given our business, like the two biggest, you know, sort of risk we're tracking, at least uh, in the organizations that I'm affiliated with are, you know, talent, right? How do we attract and retain talent and have a diverse workforce? You know, that's mm -hmm. really important because all voices matter. And then the second thing is uh, ESG, what's called uh, environmental sustainability and governance. How are we basically making sure that our suppliers and supply chain are following what we believe is important as an organization, right? And how do we, you know, how are we making sure that we're checking and double checking 
that they are following our policies, our rules, our codes of conduct, and, and that they're the right supplier for, you know, our needs. Awesome. Awesome. So a couple more questions here. Someone said, kindly explain uh, what a risk register is a little bit more. We get that a lot. And let me just say this. Don't worry too much if you just have an Excel spreadsheet with a list of risks. That's yeah. totally fine. OK, that's yeah. totally fine. Um, and, you know, if you have a list of risks, try to make sure that it is um, business stated in business terms. Your risk statement should be we will have or we could potentially have a data leakage or data loss event. Let's call it that way. I'm gonna, not going to use the word breach because breach is just one type of data loss, but I could have a data loss event. It's important to put that in the risk uh, register, but more importantly, you want to say in the event of a data loss or a, you know, a data leakage, it could impact the business in this way. It could cause us reputational harm. It could cause us financial harm. It would cost us money to clean it up. We may need to revamp some of our processes and procedures because we're not really doing um, you know, identity and access management well, which is what maybe the root cause is, right? Yes. And someone else asked here, do risk scenarios need to be um, detailed or, or uh, uh, simpler? I would say the risk register, the list of risks should be as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And the risk scenarios should be as detailed as possible, right? Like they should be really detailed, really assumptive. You know, this is what we assume. And you may have the exact same scenario. Let's say data loss is a scenario or data leakage. You may have the exact same scenario, but it has different assumptions because it could materialize in different ways. Sometimes it could materialize inside your organization. Sometimes it materializes from a relationship you have with a supplier or a partner, right? So you want to make sure that you you consider both. Lisa, another right. question here. Isn't uh, technology risk assessment a continuous process? Yes. Or Okay. <laughs> yes. And, and someone asked, is ESG in manufacturing or production? The answer is no. Uh, it can be in any organization. Um, if you read any of the, uh, I'm a fan of, of the Lululemon company, and they said that they closed more stores during COVID from ESG than any other time in the company's history. So ESG can affect all of us because we are all in an ecosystem, right? Okay, so I am getting the cue that we need to wrap up here. I know okay, that there good. are other questions that we did not get to, but Lisa, this was great. Uh, and I want to remind the audience that, again, Lisa will be covering this topic in detail at the North America Conference in New Orleans next month. So please, yes, 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 I'm excited. And we, at the risk of making this a commercial, ISACA does have a couple of risk scenarios products coming out very shortly. So stay tuned. Thank you all again, Lisa. Thank you very much. And I'll give you the last word. Any parting words? Just that there's a ton of resources. You know, ISACA has invested heavily in the risk uh, profession, right? So I know we have audit profession, information security profession, governance professionals, compliance professionals, but there's also this notion of a risk professional. And so I, there's a lot of really good um, resources out there, you know, that I've done that my, my colleagues have done, um, you know, uh, and so please do definitely look at those. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you everyone for joining us, joining us until next time. Take care, everyone. Bye everybody. Bye.